Module 4 is a new module. There is new content. Uh, we're going to draw from selected portions of the textbook. And we'll be drawing from a good bit of online resources. Uh, so we're going to have to pull from a variety of things instead of everything being organized in a discrete uh, prepackaged uh, module or chapter in the textbook. Uh, what we're going to do is is pull together some fresh content. And what we want to do is give you a quick view of the hats that cybersecurity professionals wear. Okay, so essentially, when we have the module uh, ready and the rest of the study guide and student learning objectives pulled together by Wednesday, uh, it will read black hats, white hats, and the tools of preference for analysis and detection. Okay, that's the long description of the header. But up here, what you'll see is hats and hacker tools, right? The first assignment, uh, the first two assignments actually are due by 1 p.m. Wednesday, 9 November this week. And we've been talking about getting Kali set up and we've actually walked through some steps for how to do this. Essentially, there's three points and this is the uh, write-up for it. So what you're going to do is uh, walk through some of the same steps we've taken the time to uh, review. If you have any questions with anything that's uh, written here, um, if you haven't started it yet, uh, it now is a good time to get started. In the original uh, first module, there was an assignment where you did some things to optimize your machine. And hopefully you have been keeping up with the latest version of Ventura on the Mac and uh, version 22H2 on Windows. Is there anyone who is hearing this detail now that doesn't recall any mention of this the previous week? I just have a problem because my computer, no matter what I do, it won't update to 22H2. It's still 21H2. And it says it's up to date and it won't update anymore. Okay. There is a fix for that. And I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. I appreciate you bringing that up. So that is a common experience. Uh, sometimes when you uh, run here and then you go to update and security, you're still on 21H2 and you run updates all day long and there it, it never really presents. Um, in some cases, the cumulative update has to be loaded first. So if you look at the update history, um, one thing to make sure of is that the October cumulative update has, has already been pushed, right? So you'll notice the cumulative update for Windows 10 version 21H2. If you don't have this, uh, you can go to the Microsoft download catalog and reference KB5018410 and then download this update and uh, manually, um, manually do this. There's usually a repair tool, so when students, you know, when people start having problems pulling the new feature release, uh, you can usually Google, you know, my Windows won't update to 22H2, um, you know, what's wrong? And and uh, there's usually a, a utility that you can run that will pull this. Um, we'll take a look at that as soon as we finish uh, reviewing other stuff. Uh, is anyone else having that difficulty as well? I know, I know it hits some people and not others. It's kind of a mystery. You have three points for the prep and setup of Kali as a virtual machine. We'll be using that a good bit. 
in the last module, but we want to prepare uh, and have it set up. So once your system is optimized, you'll be downloading VirtualBox and the extensions. Uh, you know, once again, we've we've gone through this, right? So each of the yellow uh, highlights calls out what it is you need to submit. And um, you can basically uh, log one point of credit for each one. So after you're finished running your optimization, you capture a screen showing the version of your OS as a, as a proof. Once you uh, capture a screen of your new uh, version of Kali, so when you download the Kali VirtualBox appliance, uh, it does expand into about a 10 gigabyte file. Um, we have mentioned that uh, you can use Breezip in the Microsoft Store to unpack the download, the 2.3 gigabyte download for Kali. Um, there's another tool you can use for the Mac. You want to show that you have a VM directory with your virtual system. Um, gosh, I'll have to correct that misspelling. Virtual system files displayed. So what are we saying? You're going to show in your in your um, system where you have unpacked your Kali machine. So you can go ahead and when you unzip it, put it in a temp folder and then point to it and add this machine in VirtualBox and that will import the machine. It may not necessarily um, put a new footprint inside the VM folder or inside the VHD folder, but you can still show it uh, sitting here unpacked in your temp folder. And uh, if you hold your pointer over it and it shows it's 17.9 gigs, then uh, that'll do it. So that's the third criteria for the assignment for module four, first assignment module four, 4.1. You're gonna wanna run it and show that it's running and uh, if you basically just add it with all the essential details, it's not sufficient to show it sitting there on the screen. You have to run it and show your login. And there's a very simple, um, simple reference online to the login for uh, Kali. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, but that's part of the Part of the charm of the homework is that um, different flavors of hacker tools will have different default logins for the root uh, root account. Um, any questions about the first assignment for module four? No question. Okay. I will try to have uh, a quick video uh, walking through the entire thing. Um, but we've all been through parts of this before. So uh, basically, uh, before class starts, I'll have something out here you can click and reference about setup of Kali. Uh, it may be from a previous year or a previous class. Um, but it'll basically show you the quick steps to work the um, the setup. Second assignment for your <laughs> for your module four solution, you will repeat the module three solution. Only, and this is something we've also talked about. You're going to set up screen recording capability. So if you're using a PC, you'll install Screencast-O-Matic on your system and show this loaded in your programs and features listing inside the control panel. That's the first point, right? If you're using a Mac system, simply update your iTunes app 
and capture this for submission because you can use iTunes to capture the screen, can record the screen and audio annotations using iTunes and a Mac. Um, so when we say control panel, what you're gonna do is open up control panel. And if you don't have it on your start menu, you can always add it. But if you start typing control, and then if your screen shows this, you simply show large icons and navigate to programs and features. And you'll see Screencast-O-Matic here. So that's the first criteria. You're going to get a screenshot showing in your control panel listing a recent installation. It should say installed on. There should be a date between now and the deadline 1 p.m. Wednesday. Okay. Um, you just go to Google and search for Screencast-O-Matic and you go right to the website and install it. When you start to capture, it'll prompt you to load the load the thing. Now, if you don't have it listed in your control panel, you, if you have, uh, if it presents in your start menu, you can capture that as well and that, that, that'll work just as much. The second piece of the 4.2 assignment is to make sure it's working correctly. On your laptop, you should be able to use this. And what I want you to do is to navigate to any website that's a favorite of yours, start a recording, and begin with narration, something like, hello, this is... This is your friend Mortimer, <laughs> and today we're reviewing my favorite website, right? I'm talking about a five second or less recording. I want you to save the video clip and upload it. That's the second point. I want you to demonstrate that you can use either iTunes or Screencast-O-Matic, depending on your platform, to uh, basically display something work some action on the screen, and uh, annotate some comments, right? Any questions about the 4.2 assignment? Four dot three assignment. <laughs> so I want you to reference the criterion tasks for the module three solution. Only this time capture a video recording while you are performing remote access observations of the Banshee system. You may resubmit previous email requests as if these were valid for this round. So what am I saying? You won't have to coordinate uh, officially for physical access or to have a record of approval to analyze the system and data. Okay, those steps we're just gonna, you, if you have those, uh, logged correctly for your um, module three solution, you can just uh, submit those again. You don't have to do that again. Now, what you do need to do is just send me an email and ask me uh, when's the nearest time you can get on the machine. We're going to keep it simple. You can text or email. You can call by voice. I can tell you when the next available uh, time slot is. And you can, or or time slots, you can tell me which one you want, and I will reserve the time for you. Okay. I'll confirm in text or voice or email. Uh, yeah, you have an hour from this time to this time. Okay. Uh, we won't be working in two hour windows. Essentially, um, you, you can stop at the, you can start at the top of the hour. You have to be off. Uh, by the end of the hour, you'll have 60 minutes. The important thing is you're going to resubmit your other criteria. So the other criteria must be submitted again. The screen captures, including the full recording. And any case where a logout occurs or the system was left in a changed state will result in zero credit. Now, it's really important to understand you only have one attempt to capture a recording of the system and data access on Banshee. That's it. One shot. Which means, now, when is it due? A week from today, 
a week from today, uh, your recording and the other screen artifacts, your recording and the other screen artifacts are due. So as long as you have email requests, um, as long as you have both of those documented requests from solution three, yeah, we're not going to go through that email back and forth, back and forth thing again. Um, but I do want you to get screen captures of the open and active applications on screen, any minimized applications on the taskbar, any tabs in the browser. But you must be sure while the recording is running that you return the system to the state you found it in. So it's probably a good idea to be taking screenshots and to save them along the way as a reference. And then you need to clear by locking the screen and not signing out, okay? If you log out or there's stuff that's changed, your recording will tell on you, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and what I'll do is we'll log some credit for your recording, but you won't get full credit because Basically, you did something you weren't supposed to do on Banshee, and then now Sydney Corinth is off to the races because you tipped. You you basically tipped your hand, and uh, Sydney Corinth is aware that someone is wise to them, and the whole picture changes. And uh, yeah, are there any questions about how this solution will work? I have a question. Yes. So for the recording, what format does the video need to be in? What file format? Well, that's a good that's a good question. Uh, as long as it is a standard video format that uh, I can view, um, MPEG is usually the typical format, right? Okay. So, so an MPG file is typically the best uh, video format. And, uh, you know, it's it's very efficient in terms of the size. Uh, we've all had practice with module three, right? Everybody's had practice. And so you don't have to be meticulous and slow, and you don't have to have perfect audio. Um, this isn't a case, and I, I want to caution everybody, uh, it's not uncommon for people to go ahead and and uh, turn the recording on and then they get flustered and and then uh, you you can just keep recording and start over while it's recording and as long as as long as the recording shows that you signed on to a locked system you did the things you were supposed to do and you locked it and put it back the way it was. Uh, you can do multiple attempts in your recording. You just want to put a note in there when you submit it. So if you have an hour-long recording, but the last time you tried to do it, <laughs> the last time you tried to work it, you got it right, and everything was perfect, but, but you flubbed twice, and you started over twice. Don't stop the recording, okay? Just don't. Leave it rolling the whole time. And then, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. Uh, it it's very unlikely that uh, any student would not receive some kind of credit uh, from the module for solution uh, because because you're getting credit for other things. You know, if if uh, your documented requests for physical access and approval to analyze the data and and uh, system in in Sydney Corinth's office, you know, as long as that's still in the mix from solution, the solution in module three, you're going to get credit for that, right? If you have any other screen captures while you're in there, you'll get credit for that. Um, you just don't want to, you don't want to sign out or, or uh, be in a case where you've obviously changed the system and, and now there's a recording of it and you left it that way, okay? Let me say that again. If there's a recording that you submit where you screwed it up, 
but you left it screwed up, uh, that that would be zero credit. The fact that you're recording, the fact that you're recording and you have the ability to back up the recording and go back in there and fix it. Um, that's the advantage of recording the session, right? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Yes. The recording is your friend. It is a resource. It is not a trap. It's not there to ensnare you or to play gotcha. Uh, nobody has to have perfect uh, dictation or audio, right? If there are internet gaps or a power outage and those things will happen and it botches your recording, we'll give you a do-over and you can start from scratch, okay? So you can basically just send me an email and say, oh, the power went out and I lost everything. And I may ask to see the recording. OK. In which case, you know, it's real obvious, but um, that's that's the extent of it. OK. Now, any questions? Any questions? About what we've lined up, you have two. So you have two assignments that are due by start of class 1 p.m. Here it is. OK. You have one that's due a week from now. And I will be posting by the start of class on Wednesday, some fresh material and a new study guide, brand new study guide, okay? So we're gonna present the roles and tools commonly used by cybersecurity professionals, right? And the first, the first student learning objective reads, Explain the types of hats and typical roles of cyber professionals, including important responsibilities expected while performing these services. Okay. That's the first uh, student learning objective. And then the second student learning objective that you can uh, expect for module two is provide essential information and demonstrate use so you want to be able to tell me about it, and you want to be able to demonstrate that you can use it, okay? For common tools used by the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, the good, the bad, and the ugly is a reference to a Clint Eastwood movie. It's very, very uh, common. And there were role plays um, in this movie, right? They, they literally had good guys, bad guys, and ugly guys. And one of the things that I want to cue you into is that when you reference your textbook, okay, so do we have other students that have access to our textbook through vital source? Anyone? No, not me at least. Okay. Um, well, you might have it through Amazon Kindle. You might have a PDF copy through uh, a respectable, valid source uh, out on the internet. There's a number of ways you can get uh, this, this textbook. But essentially, if you search for certain terms like white hats, right? White hats, you have two adversarial groups, the white hats, law enforcement and security professionals, right? And then the black hats are the hackers and computer criminals, right? Now, there are times where uh, people are in, engaged and, and they have the role and responsibility to, to role play. So when we talk about knowing the tools and the responsibilities, it is important that cyber professionals role play. We want you to put yourselves in the shoes of a bad actor, a malicious actor. We want you to um, intentionally try to do things to hack a system or the data, but we want you to do it in an ethical manner. Ethical hacking is a standard. That's part of this. And so when you look at all of the different roles and responsibilities that are expected, right? If you were 
role playing the part of a bad person and uh, you were using those tools, you would you would essentially uh, be doing some ethical hacking. And so you're going to get, we're going to get different. Um, our textbook is, is a good reference, but um, the content is organized a little differently. And what I'd like to do is kind of pull selected references together. That's why we're, you're seeing some of this, right? So you may have heard about bug bounty programs where uh, people find bugs in software and they turn them in, they get a bounty. Um, that's the, on a software level, people who do that with application development, um, that's a type of ethical hacking, right? But when we're talking about networks and systems, if you're trying to get on there, uh, what you wanna do are perform the tasks of a hacker, but you wanna do it in an ethical manner where everything's above board. And the simple truth is it's gonna, the content that we're pulling is coming from multiple modules. So when I look at white hats, well, that's in module one. When I look at ethical hacking, that's in module two and module six and module nine and module 12, right? <laughs> And then when I look at penetration testing, so if you're a penetration tester, basically uh, penetration testing is one of the tasks that an ethical hacker would perform uh, while they're pretending to be uh, an ugly or bad person, right? And then module 11, so part of implementing information security are to perform uh, routine tests on across a network to try to penetrate a network or a system. So what I'm going to be doing over the next uh, day or so is pulling together specific information from each of these different textbook modules. And again, I'm going to call them chapters just for the sake of sanity because I don't want people... Uh, getting mixed up with uh, Blackboard modules. But here you have a reference to penetration testing in information security maintenance, right? Um, and then further down. So quite a bit in chapter 12. wonder if they have stuff in the appendix about this. Hackers use Kali but so do security professionals. What about gray? Gray hats. Anyone? Black hats, gray hats, gray hats. Nothing about gray hats. So we have white hats, black hats, but no gray hats. Is that the real world? What do you think? Has anyone ever heard of the term gray hat? I haven't, but like, I'm kind of assuming that it's the bad people that do good kind of sort of thing. Yeah, depending on the context, that's come up quite a bit, right? So when you talk about, um, and here, let's, let's move this um, down. So if I look at, You're going to see different. Uh, so, so depending on depending on which circles you run in, uh, you're going to be getting different um, definitions of what this means. But basically, black hat, white hat, and gray hat hackers here they're spelling gray G R A Y. And then there's a wiki article. It's a computer hacker, it's a computer security expert. Let's look at the wiki. So this is kind of a moving target. Uh, you can have people who hack an organization unsolicited. Let me say that again. 
you can have people who hack organizations intentionally unsolicited. And then they approach the organization and say, oh, did you know all your stuff is, you know, anybody can get into your Kool-Aid. And I would, I would be very careful to tell you that this is not consistent with ethical standards and hacking. So a lot of times, depending on how a gray hat, um, a gray hat professional conducts or promotes their services, uh, there may be elements of that that are considered to be less than ethical. Um, so you get somebody that, you know, according to one de definition of a gray hat hacker, when they discover a vulnerability, instead of telling the vendor how the exploit works, they may offer to repair it for a small fee. Well, is that entirely ethical? It's like, oh, hey, you're, you're, I'm not telling you how I hacked it, but I'll repair it if you pay me. Now, that's pretty sketchy. And, and, and it's not, con again, it's not consistent with the notion of an ethical hacker. Ethical standards, right, are there partially, but not completely. And so what they'll do is they'll get into somebody's Kool-Aid, but then they'll try to use it as leverage to get some kind of favorable remuneration for their services. And that kind of stuff can backfire, right? So gray hat hackers are hackers who basically uh, apply their skills. Again, we're talking about unsolicited unsolicited vulnerability assessments, unsolicited penetration testing, unsolicited um, act activity to assist somebody, right? So this idea of a black hat, it's a hacker that violates computer security for their own personal profit or out of malice. And um, you can have cybersecurity professionals that role play a black hat hacker. They role play a gray hat hacker. Um, and, and of course, white hats are the ethical, um, ethical outspoken, overt, I'm here to help you kind of uh, professional. Now, one aspect of white hat that's really not real world. Okay, so when you talk about the real world, when somebody says, yes, I'm going to do this ethically, and I'm going to hack you ethically, and I'm going to uh, play the role of a bad person, and so I'm going to be a white hat hacker. Um, the problem is, is that white hat hackers are playing by the rules. And they're playing, they're they're overt, and and they're and that's good. I mean, if if a corporation wants to hire a white hat hacker, an ethical hacker, somebody who performs penetration testing, they're going to do that in a manner where they abide by all the rules. They do everything they're supposed to do. They don't violate any sketchy standards or whatever, right? Then you have people who are uninvited guests. These are the malicious actors, right? And then you have folks that are in between that are basically trying to flip this. Oh, hey, I discovered a problem. I'm sure you want me to fix this for you, um, right? And uh, they don't tell you. They don't tell you how it works. They just say they're going to fix it for a fee or... If you pay them, then they'll tell you how it works. And uh, there are a class of hackers that basically out vulnerabilities and they report them openly and they're not interested whatsoever in reimbursement. It's not about, it's not about um, collecting money. It's not about becoming, uh, but it's more about becoming famous.
So they want to go to the Black Hat conference and brag about how they discovered a vulnerability with Cisco firewalls, a critical, a critical um, vulnerability with Cisco firewalls. And they were the first to uh, discover it. And they approached Cisco and tried to report it. And Cisco was resistant. Cisco was slow to listen. Cisco was... Well, there were a lot of hoops to go through for somebody to actually look at what they discovered. And after a time, this black hat hacker, this um, person who discovered something really bad about Cisco firewalls decided, you know what? I'm not gonna wait another week for somebody to call me back. I'm just gonna post this online in a forum. And so they're good guys from the sense that they put out a vulnerability and then when the when the word is out, everybody has to respond, everybody has to do something with it. It is common for large companies to be a little resistant and a little slow to respond to unsolicited approaches by outsiders or third parties who claim, hey, um, your firewall is full of holes, you might wanna know about this. A lot of times um, that doesn't play real well. And so instead of trying to get money, uh, it's really more about fame or it's really it's really motivated out of ethics. Now, this is where it gets really weird and it gets kind of gray and muddy again, no pun intended. But what do you say about a hacker who discovers a serious problem with Microsoft server operating systems or with Cisco networking firewalls? And they try to tell Microsoft and they try to tell Cisco and they can't get a word in edgewise and they can't get anybody to take them seriously. And they don't have access to forums where they can share this information. They may say, well, before a really bad person gets a hold of this, this would be an easy method to really hurt a lot of folks. I'm going to I'm going to post this vulnerability and they send it into a legitimate channel like the federal government, like an incident handling uh, or a bug clearing house. They report it as a CEV, at which point the organizations are required to do something, right? So it's not about it's not about getting famous. It's not about getting paid. It's about exposing. It's about uh, outing and exposure that could be very very bad. And they just want somebody to fix it, but they can't get the time of day with people. So you have this entire range of experiences with role playing, in among cyber professionals, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the problem is, is that it all depends on the context and whether or not the company is ready, willing, and able to listen to someone who's discovered an issue. And there are cases where uh, other companies are ready, willing, and able to pay somebody to shut up. So they pay them a small fee. They have to sign a form that says, okay, you've repaid, you know, we've reviewed this. It's, uh, it's legitimate. We're going to pay you, but that means you don't get to put it online. We're just going to fix it with the next cumulative release, with the next update. And we don't look bad, but but you get rewarded. So it's kind of like a bug fee. And, and those kinds of things happen. Um, just think in terms of white hat, black hat, and gray hat as some of the primary roles, we'll put some links together for the draft of our module uh, study guide. Has anyone ever heard of red teaming and, and uh, red team exercises or steal the flag exercises? Yeah. Okay. Does anyone understand the difference between red team exercises and what, what black, gray, and white hats do in terms of context? If you've heard of the, okay, well, if you've heard of the term of steal the flag, they have this, um, so another thing that cybersecurity professionals do is they love contests, right? So when you talk about uh, honing your skills and getting bragging rights, uh, red team and steal the flag. 
So sometimes it's called STF. Capture the flag, steal the flag, CTF. That I guess that's the more common acronym. I've always called it steal the flag. Capture the flag. Uh, you have red teams and blue teams. This is kind of like a military exercise where you divide your troops up into red team and blue team and whoever gets to capture the flag wins. This is a, an environment where you're dealing with mock-up scenarios. The important distinction for capture the flag competitions is that it's a simulated scenario. When you're dealing with white hat, black hat, and gray hats, you're not dealing with a simulated gaming environment. Let's say this again. When you're dealing with black hats, white hats, and gray hats, you are not typically, you're not typically in a scenario where you you have a conjured simulation where people are gaming each other to get bragging rights about their skills. Red team capture the flag scenarios happen uh, for training purposes and bragging rights among cyber professionals. But black, gray, and white hat scenarios typically happen with live production systems that are being used in the workplace in real time. And it's not a joke, and it's not a simulation, and it's not a scenario, and it is... And there are still bragging rights. There are similarities there, but it's a whole different dynamic, right? In the red team capture the flag scenario, everybody's proud to announce the winner. In a black hat, gray hat, white hat live scenario with a production system, very few organizations are interested in announcing the winner. Most of them are just interested in fixing the problem quietly. So they continue to have a service or products that uh, people want to buy so they can stay in business. Does everyone understand that distinction? Yes. Yeah. This is one of those things that I don't think is clearly spelled out in a lot of material online or elsewhere. So that's one thing we want to call out about the scenarios. And that's, uh, that's something that you'll see reflected in our third student learning objective for the module. We're going to stop now. Um, thank you for joining us today. Does anyone have any questions or comments before we clear the screen? I do not. Okay. Please uh, jump on the assignments in Blackboard quickly and uh, let me know if you run into any snags. And we'll see you in class on Wednesday. Good luck with you. Get good luck with your second attempt of the module three solution. See you on Wednesday. Yeah. Bye bye for now.